Hello everyone, and welcome back to the History of Africa. I'm your host, Andy. Last episode, we learned about the reign of Ralambo, the second king of Imerina, and the ruler who is best known for transforming the kingdom from a loose collective of associated villages into a true bureaucratic state with noble governors and legitimacy derived from religious traditions surrounding a collection of powerful amulets known as Sampi. But while the kingdom of Imerina had been rising to become the preeminent power of their isolated valley at the center of the island, Urlambo state was still a small fish compared to the giant of the 17th century Malgasy Pond. In this episode, we'll learn about the ascension of the first titan of early modern Madagascar, and examine the role it played in shaping the history of their nascent Marina neighbors. Season 4, Episode 6, Sakalav, Madagascar's First Empire. On an island full of historical mysteries, mythology, and inconsistency, the story of the Sakalava people is perhaps the most puzzling of them all. Like their Merina neighbors, the bulk of knowledge about Sakalava history comes from written compilations of extant oral traditions, passed on and maintained by noble lineages and religious officials. But unlike the histories of Merina, these histories were never organized into a single authoritative compilation like the Tantara Niandriana. Rather, a student of Sakalava history has to do things the hard way, and reconstruct the various disconnected traditions into something resembling a cohesive narrative. As a consequence, few scholarly writers have bothered to write an extensive secondary material on Sakalav compared to the dearth of writing about Imanina. This is really a shame, because the little material that we do have about the kingdom paints an extraordinary, if unfinished, portrait of a magnificent state with an unrivaled impact on the history of Madagascar. This is because, in fact, the rise and subsequent fracture of the first Sakalava kingdom provided fertile ground on which the other major polities of Malagasy history would emerge. Sakalav is the first true empire in Malagasy history, and one which paved the way for all others which came after. But before we get ahead of ourselves, let's back up a little bit. Who are the Sakalava people? Where did they come from? and what allowed them to rise to such an important position in the island's history. Ethnicity in Madagascar is an interesting topic in and of itself. In theory, Madagascar is one of the few relatively homogenous countries in Africa, since you could consider all people of Malgasy heritage to belong to the same ethnic group. After all, one of the most common methods of dividing people into ethnic categories is by the language they speak. And, well, everyone in Madagascar speaks Malgasy. Sure, there are regional dialects, and these dialects are sometimes quite distinct, but native speakers of one dialect will, for the most part, be able to understand the others at least a little bit. And while each group may have had immediate ancestors, for the most part, they all come from the same two entwined roots, a mixture of Bantu and Austronesian ancestry. The proportion between the two may vary. The Sakalava, for example, have a higher proportion of Bantu ancestry than most on the island. But cultural and genetic mixing between migrants from these two locations define the origins of each group on the island. However, anyone with a passing familiarity with Malagasy history will tell you that this isn't really how things are seen. While all people share a Malagasy identity and language, the island is populated by numerous subcultures with their own unique cultural identities. Rather than language or geographic origin, the primary distinguishing factor of each Malagasy ethnic group is lifestyle. And this is also true in the case of the Sakalava. Unlike the Merina, whose lifestyle historically revolved around intensive settled rice farming, the majority of Sakalava lived semi-nomadically. Residing on the island's western coast, the Sakalava people were mostly cattle herders. They migrated in regular intervals from field to field, grazing their cattle until the field was stripped clean, then moving back to the old field which has since regrown, before returning again next year. To supplement their diet of beef and milk, Sakalava people also regularly planted small fields of rice in ditches or stream beds, which they would then harvest when they returned to the field next year. It is this lifestyle, more than anything else, that separated the Sakalava from other Malgasy cultures, and would become the central tenet of Sakalava identity. The early history of the Sakalava is shrouded by an impermeable veil of uncertainty. 
Since there is no definitive canon of Sakalava oral history to interpret, even a question as simple as how the Sakalava made their way to western Madagascar is a matter of intense ambiguity. The ethnogenesis of the Sakalava is closely tied to the arrival on Madagascar's western coast of a mysterious family known as the Maroseranya. Now, I'm not kidding when I say that the Maroseranya were a mysterious bunch. In fact, it seems like nobody can truly say for certain where the Maroseranya even migrated from. One common retelling, as relayed by Abdallah, the prince of a small village in southwestern Madagascar, claims that the Maroseranya originated from an Arab prince who landed in the far south of Madagascar from parts unknown. This prince then had children with local women, and his descendants eventually branched out and moved north, forming the origins of the Maroseranya. A different retelling, which allegedly originates from an old written chronicle from the Sakalava kingdom, claims that the Marosaranya were, in fact, a group of wealthy Malgasi royals from a city in the far south called Mijombi. One day, a prince from this family arrived on the shores of western Madagascar with a fleet of ships full of gold and other treasures, which he used to bribe local villages to accept his rule. The fact that this story originates from a historical Sakalav document seems to be a slam dunk to make it the official version of events. While we've discussed oral tradition a lot in this season, Keep in mind that Madagascar was a region with pretty extensive use and knowledge of the written word, especially in the south and southwest regions of the island. This chronicle was written in Arabic abjad, which, when used to write Malgasi, is called Sorabe. So, this should be it, case closed on where the Marosaranya came from, right? Except that the original Sakalava chronicle was lost in a fire in 1907, with no known reproductions, the only source of the contents of the chronicle is the word of a local prince who claimed to summarize an incomplete, highly abridged version from memory years later. Anthropologists have also produced their own speculated origins for Amaro Saranya, ranging from the far north region of Madagascar, as well as a purported connection to the Shona kingdom of Mwene Mutapa in modern-day Zimbabwe, Swahili's from the port of Sofala, or even people from the Indian subcontinent. None of these traditions can be outright rejected, though some of them are clearly much more plausible and better supported than others. However, probably the best supported theory of Sakalava ethnogenesis comes from the work of Emil Berkeley, a missionary and anthropologist working in Madagascar in the 20th century. Berkeley relied on close analysis of cattle markings, small symbols carved into the ear of Cebu cattle, which people in Madagascar used to identify ownership. These symbols are commonly associated with regional ancestry, and are maintained consistently from generation to generation. Birkeli found that cattle owned by Maroseranya descendants used a diverse set of cattle marks which bore resemblance to various locations throughout Madagascar, mostly from the far north and southwest, but a little bit too from the southeast. The study aligns best with the Sakalava tradition relayed from the Burnt Chronicle, but also likely indicates that the Marosaranya were not a single group which migrated to western Madagascar at all. Rather, Marosaranya is a composite name of multiple extended powerful families who moved to western Madagascar from various different locations. These new nobility then gradually intermarried with each other, eventually coalescing into a single extended family unit, the Marosaranya. Beyond the origins of the Marosaranya, Sakalava history remains quite mysterious. Even the etymology of the Sakalava name itself is unclear, with the ethnonym being explained differently by distinct, often contradictory folk etymologies, and the speculation of scholarly observers. French naturalist Alfred Gondedier assumed that, based on his limited knowledge of the Malgasi language, that the term Sakalava had to derive from a combination of a speculative place name, Saka, and then lava, meaning long. Therefore, he figured that the name of the Sakalava people originated from basically Saka's people living throughout long distances. He used this etymology to favor his own speculation of Marosaranya origins, which connected the Sakalava people to another nearby Malgasi people group, the Ante Saka. Ante, after all, roughly means the people from. So the Sakalava and the Ante Saka had to share a common origin from an unidentified place called Saka. Guandidier's theory, though quite compelling, 
has been mostly discarded due to how heavily it relies on the man's own speculation. Others have proposed, in a spin on Gondidier's theory, that Saka is simply an antiquated term for people. So Sakalava itself simply means the people who live over long distances. If you are a proponent of the fringe theory, which relates Sakalava origins to the Moine Mutapa kingdom, then you'd probably like to note that a 1616 journal of a European merchant refers to the people of western Madagascar as Sukulamba. One anthropologist later used this journal to try to evidence a connection between the Sukulamba and the Mashukulumbe, a people from modern Zambia who live just past the northern frontiers of Mutapa. But this theory is fringe for a reason. The name Sukulamba almost certainly originates from just a European observer mishearing the name Sakalava, while the similarity to the name Mashukulumbe is almost certainly coincidental. However, the most popular etymology, which is also the most common among Sakalava oral histories, and the one that I personally take the most seriously, is that the name is derived simply from an antiquated term for long rivers, likely deriving from the fact that western Madagascar is uh, home to several long rivers. It is along the banks of one of these rivers where the first significant king of the Marosaranya dynasty, a man named Andrea Misara, set up his capital. Andrea Misara is, in many ways, analogous to Andrea Manello in Imerina. Like Andrea Manello, Andrea Misara is typically viewed as the gateway between history and legend in Sakalava historiography. On the one hand, he is generally believed to be a real historical figure. On the other, the details of his life are obscure to the point of being essentially unknown. Also, like Andrea Manello, it's not super clear when exactly he ruled and we have no choice but to use the date of his better-documented son's life as a measuring stick. With that in mind, he is usually estimated to have risen to power in the early 17th century, the same time that Ralambo was ruling in Imerina. Andre Misara was the second generation of Marosaranya to arrive on the west coast. His father was one of the many kings of small independent states that stretched across the Malagasy West, each governed either by one of his relatives or by local Fasimba kings. When Andre Misara became an adult, he decided to leave his hometown to strike it out on his own. He and a small group of associates moved north, establishing a new settlement which he called Bengi. Now, I'd love to go into the details and legends surrounding Andre Misara, but sadly, this season is not about Sakalava, so I need to summarize quite a bit here. According to an oral tradition transcribed by Birkeli, Andre Misara proved incredibly successful in expanding his authority. Many of the Fasimba kings around the territory of Bengi willingly submitted to Andre Misara's expansionist authority, while others resisted and were crushed with military force. These newly integrated subjects were then ascribed with a new collective identity, the people of the long river, Sakalav. Andre Misara proved to be quite a successful ruler, expanding his kingdom at a torrid pace. At its height, his kingdom would stretch from the river Monamba in the north to the Isalo Massif in the south. Though even the Sakalava oral histories themselves will typically add the detail that Andre Misara's real control over these new territories was usually quite limited. Regardless, the kingdom, which now stretched roughly 6,000 square miles, was by a long shot the most extensive state that Madagascar had ever seen. Don't forget that Imerina, as we are covering it now during the rule of Ralambo, still only consists of a few dozen villages and settlements around a set of 12 hills, a blip compared to Andre Misara's 6,000 square kilometer kingdom. So how much stock should we put into the claims of the existence of this early Sakalava state? Does anything actually back up that such a large kingdom existed this early? in western Madagascar, beyond some potentially propagandistic promulgations by Sakalava nobles? Well, it turns out the answer is yes. A journal recorded from the French sailor Pierre Duval, who passed by Madagascar in the year 1602, seems to provide the much-needed evidence that can back up the existence of a large Sakalava kingdom at the dawn of the 17th century. Duval reports widespread warfare between kingdoms throughout the western coast likely a description of Andre Misara's campaigns to subdue his foes. But, more importantly, he reports seeing women with shaved heads on a few different occasions. This seemingly innocuous detail is actually the most crucial evidence we have. 
You see, in later Sakalava kingdoms, the death of Marosaranya family members resulted in an official time of mourning, during which all subservient people were compelled to shave their heads as a sign of respect to the deceased royal. This tradition was only true for the people who would become the Sakalava, since other people ruled by Marosaranya dynasties did not replicate this cultural practice. The fact that not only Duval, but that other European observers also noticed this practice on multiple occasions on the Malkasi coast is a pretty good sign of the spread of what would become Sakalava culture during this time. Confusingly, these sources do make reference to the existence of a myriad of small kingdoms in western Madagascar at this time, but this actually aligns pretty well with Sakalava oral history, which again claims that Andre Misara's actual authority over the areas he conquered was often quite limited. So Andrea Misara's Sakalava kingdom was less likely to be a single unified state, but rather a system of multiple semi-autonomous kingdoms under the nominal sovereignty of the king. So this only brings up more questions, like why was Andrea Misara able to create such a large kingdom that dwarfed those of his neighbors? Well, at least part of the answer may be explained by Laval's account. You see, Laval records that Western Madagascar was by the time of his visit, a major hub of international maritime trade. The coast was dotted with ports full of commerce. Swahili merchants from major coastal cities like Kilwa, Malindi, Pate, and Mombasa were particularly prominent on the island's western coast, to the extent where Malgasi ports often featured separate districts intended as long-term lodging for the traders. These merchants essentially acted as windows to the outside world selling goods from numerous exotic locales to eager Malgasi buyers. Items like ivory from mainland Africa and India, books and paper from Arabia, pearls from the Persian Gulf and Red Sea, gold from East Africa, Indian silver and copper, and even items from as far afield as China, Southeast Asia, and Europe made their way to Malgasi shores in the hulls of Swahili outrigger sailing ships. For the Swahili, the main thing that the Malgasi were offering was rice. Apparently, they bought rice in such enormous quantities that it typically required around 20 boats to haul a single shipment of rice back to the mainland. They also bought beef, leather, and enslaved people, who were brought back to mainland Africa to work as farmers, domestic workers, servants, soldiers, concubines, or, in many cases, were resold to merchants from Europe, India, or the Middle East for a profit. This system was immensely lucrative for the merchants involved. Laval observed that while the average Malgasi farmer might live in a humble wooden home, these Swahili merchants could afford to live in luxurious stone mansions, built specifically to mirror the architecture of those on the mainland coast. And, of course, the Malgasi rulers of the Swahili mercantile colonies were more than happy to reap the financial benefits of such business in their backyard levying irregular but heavy demands for taxes in exchange for the right to trade in their territory. While Swahilis were the predominant people represented in Malgasi mercantile dealings, they were not alone, as Somali, Arab, and even Indian merchants could occasionally be found in western Malgasi marketplaces. Starting in the 16th century, and continuing during and after the rule of Andrea Misara, European merchants also became an increasingly common sight in western Madagascar. Southeast Africa in general reached the attention of European nations for the first time as part of a larger effort to tap into the Indian Ocean trade network. In 1487, the Portuguese adventurer Pero da Cavila was tasked with finding the original source of cinnamon. He traveled over land to Arabia, where he caught a trip on an Arab trading mission to India before making his way to Sofala, a major trading port located in modern Mozambique. The Portuguese presence in Southeast Africa escalated when, as part of a wider conflict between the Portuguese and the most powerful state in the region, Kilwa, the Portuguese established a fort in Sofala and decapitated the governor who had been ruling the region for Kilwa. Portugal tried to conquer several other states in East Africa throughout the 16th century, but most of these expeditions ultimately ended in failure, with Sofala being their only lasting success. As a result, Sofala became the center of Portuguese trade in southern and eastern Africa. Sakalava, of course, was right across the water from Portuguese Mozambique, and therefore Andrea Misara had premium access to Portuguese trade, particularly firearms. Prior to the introduction of firearms, 
Warfare in western Madagascar relied on infantry using bows and arrows to complement frontline troops using a unique type of iron-barbed spear. Andre Misara and his allies immediately recognized the potential of these new gunpowder-based weapons, though, and rapidly adopted them into their armies, gaining a key technological edge over his enemies. European merchants offered other valuable products, like glass, rum, and finished goods. In exchange, the Kingdom of Sakalava served Portuguese ships as a bit of a pit stop between the Atlantic and Indian Oceans, offering beef and rice to feed the sailors, as well as lumber for ship repairs. Additionally, Sakalava kings and merchants were willing participants in the trade of enslaved labor. While the volume of slave trading was relatively small compared to the giants of the trade on the mainland, and this practice was still in its infancy under Andrea Misara, the slave trade would go on to play a distinct role in the economy of Sakalava, and would only grow from here on out. That means that if you're listening to this show from the African diaspora, particularly that in Latin America or the Caribbean, that there is an unlikely but distinctly possible chance that you have some Malgasi ancestry. Complementing his military advantage brought by trade with the Portuguese, the king's penchant for diplomacy also helped his kingdom expand. In the case of the Fasimba communities on his frontier, Andre Misara was sometimes able to negotiate their peaceful surrender and annexation through the orchestration of a political compromise. In exchange for the Fasimba paying tribute and recognizing his authority, Andre Misara pledged to allow the Fasimba to have uncontested sovereignty over his kingdom's rivers, allowing them to farm the banks and fish the waters unmolested. The king's penchant for giving subservient princes a substantial degree of autonomy likely didn't hurt in this regard either. Similarly to Ralambo in Imerina, Andre Misara also sought a supernatural justification for his rule to secure the loyalty of his subjects. For this, he promoted the emphasis on ancestral veneration, in particular a religious practice called Dadie. Now, the question of what role Andre Misara played in the creation of the Dadie religious practice is not especially clear. This can largely be attributed to confusion over which Andre Misara is actually responsible for the formalization of the religious movement. And, yes, confusingly, there are two people both named Andre Misara and both playing a very important early role in early Sakalava history. Apparently, Andre Misara's son appointed a religious leader, also named Andre Misara, at some point during his rule, who is pretty clearly a completely different dude. So a lot of Sakalava oral histories credit Andre Misara with the creation of a great deal of religious innovations, but it's not always super clear which Andre Misara they're talking about. Regardless of whether it emerged under Andre Misara or during the rule of his son, Dadie, which means grandparents and translated literally, placed a major emphasis on the collection and veneration of relics owned by ancestors. Priests named Moasie would collect body parts, like teeth and hair from past rulers, as well as objects personal to the departed ancestor, and place them in a wooden box. As a concentration of the ancestor's essence and soul, these boxes were said to possess immense supernatural power. Additionally, the Moasie also often oversaw a ritual called tromba. During this ritual, the spirit of a dead ancestor possessed the person undergoing it. Now, to audiences more familiar with the Christian tradition, the idea of possession brings associations with evil, demonic activity, horror movies, and exorcists. But to the practitioners of Dadie, the possession that occurred during Tromba was a completely innocent and actually positive thing. During the possession, the spirit of the ancestor would provide insight, wisdom, and epiphany to the possessed. It's essentially just a means for the person to ask their dead relatives for help from the other side. In terms of civic importance, the king would often undergo tromba himself, invoking the support of his passed on Marasaranya ancestors, as would many of his key advisors and subject nobility. Over time, Dadie also incorporated several Islamic practices, likely as a result of extensive contact between Arab and Swahili merchants and Sakalava people during this time period. With all that said, the Sakalava kingdom of Andrea Misara is the very first chapter of a long and complex story. Andrea Misara's kingdom, though impressive, would itself pale in comparison to the kingdoms, yes, multiple kingdoms, which his descendants would go on to create. 
while, spoiler alert, Imerina would eventually go on to become the preeminent power on the island, it's important to remember that, in this early period of Malgasy history, the Sakalave were the biggest fish. Throughout the 17th, 18th, and early 19th centuries, the Sakalave were not just the faceless enemies of the Merina, an obstacle towards their inevitable rise. They were the true power on Madagascar. At least for the foreseeable future, it is the Merina who are the underdogs. And the destinies of these soon-to-be rivals would soon clash on the battlefield. Join us for our next episode when, for the first of many times, the forces of the Sakalava clash with the armies of Imerina. Thank you for listening to the History of Africa podcast. If you like the show and the free education we provide, then we would love it if you could support the show. You can do this through supporting us monetarily at patreon.com slash historyofafrica, providing the show with a rating or a view on whichever platform you listen on, or sharing the show with anyone who you think might be interested in learning more about African history. This episode is brought to you by our supporters on Patreon, including Naomi Kanakia, Ayofagwamie, Morgan Blackmore, Sarah Penza, Dimitri, Manuel Zaudi, Alexander Travis, B.B. Milliam, Conrad Schwenke, Travis Bell, Johnny Knowles, Godfrey Sabalabie, Diz R.H., Evan Edwards, Pascal Nwokocha, Joe Maxwell, Nkechi Nwabodike, Sheyuno Lorontimain, Kwacho Amankwa, Douglas Harder, Craig Bolton, and Samuel Badu, among others. Thank you all for supporting the show. It really, really means a lot.